I became a, um, a, a writer and a, a member of an organization called the Organization for the Advancement of Space Industrialization and Settlement. It's a mouthful, so they went by the acronym OASIS, which is what those letters break down to. It was an organization started by a physicist at Princeton named Jerry O'Neill. And to show you how it's funny, how I love what I, my thing I love most of all, when things come full circle in a positive way. So we were just talking about Jeff Bezos a moment ago. So last year, he kind of came out and said that the reason he founded Amazon and the reason he's done all of these uh, things to build it up and form Blue Origin and everything was because he was a student of Jerry O'Neill's at Princeton um, in the 80s and um, read about Dr. O'Neill's ideas for moving most of humanity into space. And he decided that that was his purpose in life. And it was just like, how do I make that practically happen? Start with Amazon and then Blue Origin. I had previously was responsible for another type of satellite communication system where we would track the locations of vehicles. And that system was actually invented by Dr. O'Neill. Um, and as I got to know him and we shared our vision for building cities in space, settlements in space, he said, uh, Martin, I've come up with this idea for using satellites to locate objects on the Earth. Um, this was before GPS. And I believe that this can help eliminate um, planes crashing into each other, um, vehicles getting um, lost or stolen. It could be more efficient for people. People could find their ways around. Um, would you be willing to um, take this idea and get the government to approve it, raise the money for it, and make it happen? So I said, like, yes, Dr. O'Neill, I will, because he was, he was my hero, as, as was Jeff's hero. He's an amazing person. So um, I did that, and we did launch those satellites and track thousands of vehicles and uh, track planes. Actually, those satellites are still operating today. But as I was doing that, I said, you know, the same uh, signals of sending like latitude and longitude could be used for sending music. And it would be a way to connect, uh, to be able to listen to the same channel while you traveled hundreds of miles instead of constantly changing. It would be a way to get the kind of channels that, that I personally love, which are uh, jazz mostly, be able to get these channels outside of like New York or Los Angeles. And you know, I play keyboards and flute, so I'm, I'm, I'm deeply into music. And I'm running this company that's using uh, satellites to track vehicles. And I had previously been involved in getting the FCC to approve satellites for television broadcasting. So it was kind of logical to say, how can I combine satellites for television broadcasting with satellites to track things moving around? You don't need to watch TV while you're driving, but you do need to listen to music or now podcasts. And so it was, I think, a, a natural logical evolution. I personally don't like commercials. And so I'm like a channel surfer when a commercial comes on like I'll surf right past it. Um, I used to mostly listen between 88 and 92 megahertz because that's like the non-commercial band. Got to remember that my original, original training is I'm basically a, a what they call a spectrum manager. I, I work with the FCC to get frequencies, the electromagnetic spectrum set aside for new services. So I, I'm a spectrum geek is a, is a fair thing to say. So um, I knew there was a need for, for content without commercials. Secondly, I knew there was a need for the content that we have in big cities like New York, um, in all the other places in the country. So I said, how can I go about doing that? There was no more room on the AM and FM radio band, but I knew as a spectrum geek that there was millions of, of more spectrum than between AM and FM that could be transmitted by satellites because those frequencies were not used for other things and they passed through the atmosphere. So I studied the physics of it. I designed the satellite communication system. I found the radio frequencies that would pass through the atmosphere and pass through like the leaves and the trees, places like 
Rock Creek Park and whatnot as good as possible. There's a lot of just devil is in the details issues, like when it rains, leaves absorb more frequencies when they didn't. I pulled all this together. I went to the FCC, which I, I knew because that was my business, that was my career. I said, I propose we create a satellite digital audio radio system, uh, which is the, the technical name for Sirius XM. The first thing they said is it won't work. They said it won't work. That was the very first thing they said. Um, they, so I built a system. I don't know if you remember, there used to be USA Today was the tallest building across Potomac. So I put a pseudo satellite uh, transmitter on top of that building that had the equivalent power of a satellite in space. And WPFW uh, used to have a station on, um, on H Street, right near Chinatown, where it is right now. So I went into their studios because our offices were in um, Tech World, to, right around the corner from there. I brought the FCC people into my car and I drove them all around downtown Washington and I showed them that no, satellite communications does work. So I said, okay, it works. Uh, secondly, uh, any frequencies that you want are gonna have to be taken away from somebody else because the, the military uses all these frequencies, um, television news gathering trucks use the frequency. All the frequencies are being used by somebody or another, but mostly they're not being used very efficiently. So I then uh, created a grassroots roots movement of rural organizations. Um, a lot of them were, were search and rescue type organizations who would benefit from having 24 hours of content being broadcast all the time by satellite, including uh, aircraft and flight. And I had over 300 grassroots organizations in turn, including community groups in places like Oklahoma and, and Nebraska. I proved because the, the law says the FCC is supposed to allocate the radio frequencies, quote unquote, in the public interest. So I said the public interest is to have the same um, diversity of programming in big cities everywhere in the country. Satellites can do it. Then they said, well, it's not uh, legal for one company to control a um, hundred channels across the entire country. In fact, it wasn't even legal for one company to control more than three channels in any one city. So I said I had to come up with an entirely new concept for them. I said, well, that's true if it's free, but uh, what if we pay for, what if we make people pay for this? And they never thought of that. They said, well, that's something completely different. So what that looks like is the, the government publishes a chart and the chart shows all of the frequencies and it's separate from the lowest frequencies in the kilohertz range to the highest frequencies in the gigahertz range. And, and every use such as police radio or wireless uh, garage door openers or um, the television trucks that have the antennas that pop up and beam uh, car accident footage, every single use, um, jet planes to pilots to control tower, military to military, is a, is, a, is a use approved by the government. And in these charts, they're each given a different color. And because there's so many different uses, they even run out of color, so they start making them hashes and, and dots and stuff. So this is called a, a chart of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I know, I know that chart as well as somebody would know like the map of the US. At first, we didn't know what was wrong with our daughter, Genesis. And when a doctor comes in and, and says he's only seen, you know, less than five patients with this, they all die, they're all kids. Um, all he can recommend us to do is to meet with the transplant coordinator but not to hold out hope that we're gonna find a lung transplant for a person as small as a you know, five, six year old kid. Uh, we were both crying and um, nothing mattered to me. But still, I never thought that I personally could come up with a, a medicine because it wasn't my field. And I think if there's any lesson from my life that can be learned is that don't, don't think there's anything that you cannot do. What happened in fact, was um, I said, let me find anybody who's working on this disease. Uh, there were only 20 people in the whole US who were working on it because everybody died of it. Um, I said, I did have uh, financial 
uh, money, resources from taking serious public. So I said to them, um, look, I'll give you grants if you can come up with a, a medicine for, for my daughter. Um, they took the grants. They, they never came up with anything. Um, I contacted all the major pharmaceutical companies. They said, we're not interested in this disease, which only affects 2,000 people. Finally, uh, one doctor uh, said, you know, Martin, I think you're gonna, if you wanna save Genesis, you're gonna have to do it yourself. And um, I said, myself, I, I don't know anything about biology. They said, you could figure it out. You launched these satellites. And that's when the light turned out of my head. And they said, if you don't do this, uh, Genesis is not gonna make it. Fortunately, like uh, Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC, I, I know where you know it, where it is on Michigan Avenue. So my daughter was there week after week after week and I was there with her and they had a great, a great library. They had things like, you know, card catalogs and reader's guides that fortunately, us being kids of the 60s, we knew what they were, you know, and so I was able to use those tools, read the books, read the journal articles. I read the journal article, I wouldn't understand it, so I go to the dictionary, look up the words I didn't understand, I go back to the journal article, I'd find like a high school biology book, then a college anatomy book, and I just kept going back and forth until I could understand. I can pick out the important parts of, uh, of descriptions of knowledge um, much more efficiently than most people can. I can separate like the wheat from the chaff. Like if there's a peer reviewed journal article, most people will try to read the whole article, okay? That will take a, a long time. Uh, they may fall asleep doing it. Uh, they may get a headache from doing it. I can look at this whole article and say, you know, these three paragraphs out of maybe like 100 or 200 paragraphs have the meat of the article. So I'll digest those three uh, paragraphs. And then I'll look in the references at the back of the article and I'll go pull every article that that article referenced. And I do that until I've reached like a point of diminishing returns where I've, I've digested everything on the field. Then I'll try to write it and talk about it. Um, teach it. They say the way to learn something is, is to teach it. So I teach it to my daughter, Genesis, in her hospital bed. I taught it to my partner, Bina, you know, back at home. So the 30,000 foot view that I realized from reading these articles, in the case of my daughter, is that um, the pulmonary artery, which is the artery that takes blood from the heart to the lungs, is different from every other artery in your body, which is kind of, you know, interesting. The reason it's different from every other artery in your body is arteries take blood from the heart. Veins take blood to the heart. So all the other arteries in your body take blood which, blood, which is full of red blood cells that have been freshly oxygenated. So when your heart pumps, all your body gets freshly oxygenated blood. So those arteries um, respond to the blood cells that have fresh oxygen, except the pulmonary arteries take blood from your heart, but it takes it to your lungs to get oxygenated. So those arteries are different. They are the only arteries in the body that carry deoxygenated blood, blood full of the carbon dioxide that we get from our respiration cycle. So I said, those arteries must be different, must be biochemically different than any other artery. And if I can find a molecule that will speak just to those arteries, I can open up those arteries and leave all the rest of the arteries alone. That is the medicine. And, and that's a 30,000 foot view. That's not talking about like, you know, long names of molecules and stuff like that. That's just, I want a, a molecule that's gonna talk to these arteries that are different because they carry deoxygenated blood. I picked that because I, I think it picked me, to, to, to be frank. I, one reason I've, I've, I pick it is because I know I can achieve it. I feel it's realistic, I can achieve it. I feel I'm probably the, I, it sounds arrogant, but I think it's kind of a fact. I think I'm probably the only person in the world that can make that happen a few decades sooner than it would happen otherwise. And it's because I have the resources to do it. I have bit by bit built the teams of scientists who are most competent of doing it. I have the motivation and passion to do it because I am convinced that not only my daughter, but, but the thousands of people who take our medicines will eventually need a transplant. I didn't ask to be in the biology field, but life brought me there. 
So now I'm here, I'm gonna be the absolute best biotechnologist I can be. And the particular field that's been set before me is organ transplantation. So I, I will achieve that before the end of the decade. And I'm equally um, adamant that I do that in a green fashion. Um, that um, I do that from buildings which have zero carbon footprint and with the organs delivered by helicopters that also have zero carbon footprints. I would say don't focus on my big thinking, uh, focus on my practical doing. So like a million times more important than my big thinking is the practical doing. 1990, I said that I would launch a satellite radio system that would uh, provide 100 channels of non-commercial programming throughout all of North America, and it was launched in 2000. Um, by 2000, I said I would, I said it was the last thing I did in my life, I would develop a medicine to save Genesis, okay? Develop that medicine, actually had uh, three of them approved by 2010. In 2010, I said before the end of the teens, before the end of the 20 teens, we would manufacture an organ and bring an end-stage lung disease patient back to life. It's now 2019 and we've brought hundreds of end-stage lung disease patients back to life with manufactured organs. And now in the 2020s, before the end of this decade, I said I would like develop an unlimited supply of manufactured organs and have them delivered by zero carbon eVTOLs, an electric vertical takeoff and landing electric helicopter uh, aircraft. And that is the purpose of my life during the 2020s, other than just reading, playing music, looking at stars and hanging out with Bina. So it was a, it was a good life growing up. And I would say that um, I really had every advantage. And my parents loved me. They loved each other madly. They were married for like almost 50 years. So it was, a, it was a great life growing up. But I think it was a great life actually because of things that happened when I was really barely cognizant of what life is all about in my first 10 years. So first, my father was in a horrible car accident. And he was paralyzed as a result of this car accident. Shortly after he had set up this dental office in a suburb of San Diego, so he had no way to go to the dental office. He was paralyzed on a bed and he had borrowed all this money to set up the dental office. He had to declare bankruptcy. He had to let go of his employees. And he began studying accounting because he thought that was the only way that he could support his family. Then the next thing that happened was that they found out that there was an experimental procedure, surgery, available at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester and he was air ambulance to Rochester. They fixed his spine and he came back walking, able to be a dentist again, became a bowler. I mean, you name it, they completely fixed him. It had huge, a huge impact because, which I've only really appreciated recently, and I, I shared this story last month when I opened up at the Mayo Clinic, uh, the world's first lung restoration center, where lungs that are um, donated after people die, but are not useful for transplantation, are thrown away, and we take them from the uh, bio waste and restore them to being a perfectly good lung that ends up being transplanted in other people. And so when I cut the ribbon on the center where we do this at the, at the Mayo just a couple weeks ago, I told the story. I said, I, I want everybody to know I feel especially proud to open up this center at the Mayo Clinic because I would not be the positive, optimistic person I am if the Mayo Clinic had not really saved my father's life. If I had grown up with a father who was embittered, who felt they studied to be a dentist, and now they were stuck in bed all the time, and he would be embittered, I would have been embittered, I think. I think I would have been a depressed kid, thought of like narrow horizons. Instead, my dad was like, look, I've been cured by technology. Technology is awesome, it's positive, it's given me my life back. And I said, the fact that we have this huge center now at the Mayo Clinic, that's kind of what goes around, comes around. You know, you guys saved my father and I'm here now able to help you save, you know, hundreds of other people 
who need lung transplants. When we signed our agreement with the Mayo Clinic, I went to the waiting room, which is no longer their reception room, which is like the one that my father went to, all like wood, wood paneled stuff and, and whatnot. And it was like, whoa, this is like where I feel my life began. I think it began because that was when my father, uh, that was when like in a quantum sense, my life could have gone two directions. It could have gone the life's not fair um, and you just have to deal with it. Or life is amazing and you need to celebrate it. That was when, the, and I saw like there was like a quantum kind of split there in that um, hospital reception room at the Mayo where I had never been in, but I knew for sure my father had been there. I think because other individuals uh, helped uh, my parents overcome from, from car accidents uh, that would have led them to have very depressed lives and would have ended up bringing uh, my sister and I up in a very depressed environment. But because other people before me uh, made the world a better place with science and technology, it allowed me to be brought up in a household of optimism and positivism. There's certainly an element of luck in it, but there's also a huge element in that uh, people made their luck. Um, so the surgeons who developed that procedure, it didn't just fall from the skies. You know, those surgeons had developed that procedure over a number of years. The Mayo Clinic, if you read the story about the Mayo brothers and their wives who were, you know, unsung heroes, but were equally responsible, the, uh, the women of the Mayo, which are now being finally recognized and celebrated, were the bedrock of it. So all of that wasn't luck. I mean, the Mayo was the result of like blood, sweat, and tears and science and technology and advancement. Then the fact that um, between my father and my mother, they were persistent in pinging their doctors. Isn't there, obviously there was no Google or anything back then, but you know, pinging their doctors, isn't there anything? Have you heard of anything? So one of my parents' doctors must have told them that we heard of something at the Mayo, we'll refer you, so it was persistence. One of my mantras at United Therapeutics in, in general is just like per persistence is omnipotence. If you don't give up, you won't fail. And so there was that persistence in, in my parents' cultural DNA. Compared to what other people have been through, it has been easy. I mean, there are, we, we are in a world where people are bombed relentlessly. Can you imagine what it would be like to be a kid and you constantly hear bombs crashing. Um, there are, are people who don't eat for days at a time. I mean, I'm sure you fasted a day here or there and you know what happens when your stomach starts gripping. There are people who are in terrible physical pain. Um, there, there's a lot of bad things in the world. Um, compared to all of those bad things, I have nothing to complain about. I was thinking of inventing ways to live in space. And um, thinking of inventing ways to have uh, orbiting space cities that would relieve the overpopulation of the Earth. As we just talked, you know, both of us being kind of like children of the 60s. So when we got to the 70s and 80s, that was the first time people were kind of saying there's overpopulation because the world's population had begun doubling pretty quickly by that time. And um, I thought that, you know, why are we thinking that there's overpopulation when we're just like on one tiny speck of a planet and there's a vast galaxy of, of millions, hundreds of millions, um, actually billions of planets out there. Why can't we build um, huge colonies that orbit around the earth, orbit around the sun, go out and, and live in space? It's a kind of a logically, obvious place to go because it, it is a, it's, it's just as obvious as when everybody was sort of stuck in Europe and there were, and there was overcrowding, you know, the lords and the kings had all the land and the serfs and the regular people had nothing. Um, so then like, well, why don't we cross this ocean and go to these other places. Well, yeah, there's people there, but we could just take the land away from them and at least we'll have land. We can't take the land away from the king because they're more powerful than us and will kill us.
It does not look like the International Space Station. It looks what Jer like what Jerry O'Neill originally wrote about in The High Frontier, which was his, his book, and um, which is a miles long structure um, with a blue sky inside it because it's so deep that there's atmosphere. And on the people live on the inside cylinder, the inside surface of the cylinder of this structure. The cylinder rotates like this, so there's always artificial earth gravity on this living surface. So you're walking around, you're not floating around. You have 24 hour uh, sunlight for agricultural areas and normal day and night cycles. It's, it's just like super, 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 super sizing the biggest malls that we have today. I don't uh, necessarily think so. I think it's, it's different. I couldn't say that one is bigger, better than the other. I'm often asked by people, um, are you gonna buy a ticket to, to, uh, to go into orbit? And I always say no. I feel I'm on the coolest spaceship of all right now. I'm on the Earth, I'm an amateur astronomer. At night, I, I look at the stars and, and, and I treasure the stars. And I, this is the best spaceship in the Earth. The Earth is the best spaceship. It feels beautiful. It feels beautiful. It just feels like I always like to transcend the border of my skin. And it's why to me, love is the most powerful of, of all forces that you know humans ever experience. Because when you love another person, you have transcended your skin. You've bonded with that other person. And um, there is something in the human spirit that loves to connect. Ooh, wow, you just get right to it, don't you? <laughs> um, I think the, the meaning of life is to um, enjoy it. I think the meaning of life is to enjoy it, is enjoyment, is happiness, is happiness. And um, happiness is connected to everybody else's happiness. The more people that are happy around you, the happier you'll be and vice versa. All the way back in the uh, 1600s, uh, Francis Bacon, who wrote like the first encyclopedia of, of science, he told the king, he was a top lawyer and advisor to the King of England, and he said, you, you, you can't have most of your people starving and miserable because they're gonna revolt. And when they revolt, they're gonna ask for the king's head, and you're not gonna be very happy. Um, so it's in the king's own interest to rise everybody up. And we just heard John Doerr, I think, you know, say pretty much the same thing. One of the most successful, you know, investors in, in contemporary times is telling us that the most important thing is to help everybody else be successful. I really get my joy from seeing people happy. It really doesn't, it, it doesn't necessarily, if they're not suffering and they've learned a new subject, if somebody's found a new passion, um, if somebody's found love, you know, when I just saw like Andrew Weil and his new wife, they found love. I'm really, really happy when people fall in love. Being curious, um, loving, loving human culture, loving nature. I'd say, I'd say it's between those three things. Curiosity, like I'm curious about this. How does this work? I, I will say I am curious about everything. I don't think there's anything that I'm not curious about. I'm curious about fashion, I'm curious about art, curious about music, curious about architecture. That's why I think this uh, academy is so awesome because there's such a diversity of people who, who are recognized here and who are, who are present here. Upstairs, um, just before I met you, there's like Andrew Weil, who's like a naturopathic person. I'm talking with him and I'm talking with Steven Rosenberg who's the antithesis of that. He is like, you know, the solid, normal cancer medicine thing. But everybody is, is together and not to even get into the musicians and, the, and the, all that. So I'll show you a good example. I was out uh, yesterday for uh, coffee with a friend of mine, Art Kaplan. He's one of them, he probably is the US's number one bioethicists. And he's at NYU. We're doing, um, he was important uh, to one thing I wanted to do, which we manufacture these organs. 
But to manufacture an organ, before you put it in a person, the FDA, of course, wants you to test it in an animal. However, uh, animal is not a person. Their immune system is completely different. And if I manufacture an organ designed to work good in a person, it's not going to work very good in an animal. The animal's immune system will attack it. So I came up with the idea of how about the people who have donated their bodies to science, but we can't use their organs perhaps because they have an infection or they have cancer, um, but they've donated their bodies to science. Can we use these uh, bodies that have been donated to science to test our manufactured organs in? So that's, that's like, in a way, it's kind of crazy. Uh, nobody's done that before. Well, it, it sounds a little macabre. Anytime you're dealing with dead people, I mean, it's, it's like, this is why I kind of preferred being in satellite communications because it's, it's cleaner. But um, nobody thought about it before. Um, I met um, through, again, serendipity because I'm curious. I went to the Kennedy Center. There was a concert. I met this guy who is the head of transplant medicine at um, NYU Medical Center, who he himself had heart failure and needed to have a heart transplant transplanted into him by other members of his own team. I don't really enjoy being in biology. Um, I think I'm too empathetic a person to be in, in the life sciences. And in the field I'm in, people are constantly dying. Um, even our patients are dying. We keep them alive as long as we can, like we have a medicine for neuroblastoma. It saves the lives of half the kids with neuroblastoma. They never get cancer again. They take our medicine for two months. Five years later, they're cured. Of, uh, they, they still don't have the cancer back. They live a normal life. But the other half of the kids, the medicine doesn't work for. And I meet their parents, and, and it's some sad stories. We did save our daughter's life. That's beautiful. And she's great. She's in her 30s. She takes our medicine every day. I've met many other um, people whose the medicine stopped working for them, and eventually they died. So when I, when I wrote that book, I had to think a lot about genetic enhancement and genetic modification, disability rights. I talked to a lot of disability rights people. I talked to people with spina bifida and to really understand you know, their take on genetic modification. And I came to, a lot of people said, well, it would be good if we made our, ourselves smarter and smarter through genetic modification. And I became really skeptical about that said, you know, we can become as smart as we want right now just by, we've got, you know, unlimited hundreds of millions of children who are born and receive scarcely any education at all. Every human being's got a, a, a brain that's better than the fastest supercomputer we've ever made. I don't think it's a matter of like, we're not smart enough. The smartest people in the country got us into world war after world war and endless wars and now global warming on the brink of you know, extinction. I don't think we need more smartness. I think we need more kindness. Because I try to understand in my mind, um, why is it that um, people are so stupid and yet humanity moves forward? It seems to me if it's just like everybody was as stupid as it seems we are, myself included, you know, I do stupid things, we all do stupid things, and, uh, you know, we've got like enough nuclear weapons to kill everybody multiple times over. So why is it that when we're enmeshed with so much stupidity, we actually are living for most people the best lives that we ever lived? We um, eradicate smallpox. We've eradicated smallpox, which was the worst killer that hum human life ever faced. Um, we're on our getting close to eradicating other diseases. We very much managed HIV, which in my own lifetime was like a, a horrible epidemic that came out of nowhere and you know killed people I knew and loved. And, and now it's like a manageable condition that people can live their, their whole lives with. So when I try to understand how is it like out of all the vast stupidity of humanity, we're able to nevertheless move ourselves forward. I think it's this thing called grace that um, uh, it starts with a few people um, wanting to do something to overcome nature, overcome randomness, 
overcome evilness, like the lady I was sitting next to um, in the the Nobel laureate from um, Liberia, you know, um, overcoming evilness. And one person does that, they inspire other people. Like now I have a thousand people in, in United Therapeutics. If you ask, you know, most anybody in the company, those, what's our purpose? They say, we are gonna create an unlimited supply of transplantable organs. So nobody ever has to die on an organ wait list again. That's grace, that's, that's, that's being courageous in the face of, of both um, blind nature, bad luck, and human stupidity. Building enough nuclear weapons to kill everybody in the world multiple times over is stupid. Um, ignoring the absolutely clear evidence that humans are increasing the temperature of the world, the ice caps are melting, um, and, and not, not like turning on a dime to reverse that, but instead, in, in a very realistic, and it's, it's funny how ironic the example is, putting like the pedal to the metal and, you know, and withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accords, you know, spewing more pollution. All of, and, and we're all none, all, none of us are angels, we're all sinners. I take trips that I don't need to take, you know, I, I make more carbon footprint than I need to, to make. So I'm, I'm not saying that I'm any less stupid than everybody else. There is a good energy, and I think that that's actually a beautiful synonym for what I mean by grace. There, there is a good energy that um, persists despite stupidity. And if you look at the arc of all human history, it's kind of like Martin Luther King's quote that you know the, the arc of justice is long, but it ultimately bends toward justice. So I'd say you know the arc of good energy, the arc of grace is, is long, but it ultimately will surpass stupidity. And, and this is, um, for example, at United Therapeutics, we've built the world's largest zero carbon footprint building. Um, it's in our headquarters in Silver Spring. It has zero carbon footprint. It's a 150,000 square foot, 10 story building full of laboratories. We use the earth as our battery to store all of the heating and cooling. We put right on the walls of the building that the purpose of this building is to inspire a thousand other buildings like this. And that is grace, that is grace. It's, a, it's for the whole world to not drown in global warming is a kind of an undeserved benefit because the whole world didn't necessarily do anything to create a zero carbon footprint future. But enough people are contributing to that and it knocks on and knocks on and knocks on. Even like the smallpox example I gave. Yeah, it was great that you know Edward Jenner came up with this almost like 200 years ago, but it's the vaccinator in Afghanistan who risked her life to go into the tiniest village where people actually um, think she may be a CIA agent or something like that because of the way you know we went around the whole Osama thing, um, that risked her life to vaccinate the last person to wipe out vaccine. That's grace. And that, that one woman vaccinator to me outweighs the mountain of human stupidity. Yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical because I grew up in the age of television and I, like I said, I was a communication studies uh, undergrad major at UCLA and people were saying, oh, this generation is like ruined from watching television. And I remember statistics that like, you know, by the time a person is uh, 18, they've seen, you know, 10,000 people killed on, in Westerns and, and whatnot on TV. And in fact, I think you and I turned out pretty good. So I'm, I'm a little bit um, skeptical of that. My, I will say that like my grandkids, you know, um, play um, some video games on, on their computer, which seem like, oh my God, um, they, they, seem, they seem pretty violent, but they're actually sweet. I've, I've never seen them hurt a cat or a dog or, or, or really, you know, anything. And I think the human mind, it's, it's an extraordinary thing and it can segue off bad things. I mean, if you wanna talk about bad things affecting people, how about the Bible? I mean, I'm not saying that the Bible is bad, but I'm saying there's some like amazing violence in the Bible and people like stoned to death and burnt for no reason, just because they happen to live in a particular city. And in fact, all humanity wiped out like some bioterror type of thing. And when that was the only content that people had, they had to like read that all year long over and over and, you know, 
before our generation, people could like, you know, memorize whole parts of the Bible and whatnot. And all those people pretty much turned out okay. So I'm, uh, I'm a skeptic actually that, uh, that content is responsible for, for the problems of society. And I'm, I'm a skeptic. Um, my my uh, law program, when I went to graduate school and law school, I was a communications law program, and we were pretty much uh, persuaded that uh, freedom of speech and freedom of thought are much better than any efforts to constrain them. So I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about things like internet censorship and, and, and those kind of things. I'm really excited about the, the ability to vanquish uh, diseases that cause human suffering. Um, I think that, um, I think pain is a really bad thing and there are a lot of people um, in pain. They are in pain um, because of like neuromuscular things or they're in pain because of cancer. And I think that uh, we'll look back at this point in time and people say, you know, oh my God, I can't believe these people live their lives in pain. When I walk in a store sometimes and, and you'll see a person like their face locked in a frown, um, I used to think like, wow, that's like a mean old person. And now I realize that that person is probably just in pain, you know, and they're just kind of grimacing and trying to get through the day. If I was to say to you, do you think like one day um, the threat of mass infectious disease will be gone. And if you were to say that in Thomas Jefferson's time, they said, no, you keep crazy. There's an epidemic sweeps through here every couple of years and wipes everybody out. And nobody's going to be able to get on top of smallpox or typhoid and all these things. But oh my God, we've knocked off one after another after another. And it used to take centuries. Now we're not completely on top of HIV and there are people that don't have access to medicines. But let's look at the big picture. We took like a horrible disease that nobody saw coming, um, wiping out like virtually 100% of its victims. And then essentially, you know, 20 years, which in the span of time is a pretty short period of time. Um, in 20 years, we've, we've brought the disease under complete management. Somebody can live a normal lifespan. And we've brought the cost of those medicines down to a dollar a day, all in 20 years. And, I mean, that's, if you, a civilization that can do that will definitely positively get on top of pain and cancer and heart disease in this century. I have this one acronym um, called Unithair Martin. Uh, Unithair is the contraction of our company's name, United Therapeutics. And um, every one of those letters reminds me of one of the people who report to me and the activities that they're responsible for because I, I feel my main responsibility is working for the thousand people at United Therapeutics. I'll give you another acronym I love a lot because you mentioned virtually human and really interested in the meaning of life and in the difference between digital life and biological life. One of my favorite acronyms is OMERDA, which is uh, O uh, for organize, a definition of life. So what is the definition of life? People often stumble over that. It's like, well, I'm not really sure, is the virus alive or bacteria or whatever, is a robot alive? So biologists have agreed that things that are alive are organized, that's the O. They exchange matter and energy with the environment, that's the M-E. They reproduce, that's the R. Uh, they respond to stimuli, that's the second R. They develop, that's the D, and they adapt, that's the A. So whenever I'm stopping and thinking about is this kind of cyber life, cyber consciousness, virtual life, um, synthetic life, is this alive or not? I just remember Omerda, and that's how I, I memorize the biologist definition of life. But I've got like a gazillion of those acronyms in my head. It's a good question. I, I think it's difficult to apply one person's lessons to everybody. There are people who would be really good at being uh, a jack of all trades. And there's people who would be, you know, really good at just being a super master, uh, pianist, flautist, um, gene editor, you know, um, whatever. 
So everybody needs to be in touch with their own soul. Uh, be wary when people say you can't do something. Um, strive for happiness. Um, be practical. I've, you ask about um, little mnemonics and mantras. So the, the mantra that I live my life most by, I break down to uh, uh, C, Q, uh, P, L. And the C is be curious, curiosity, question authority. Okay, so you can be in a narrow lane, deep, deep, deep in a narrow lane and be very curious because there's no subject in the world that you cannot be endlessly curious about. If you're interested in one particular vegetable, there is an infinite amount of information that can be learned about each particular vegetable, the DNA inside the vegetable. Why does that DNA express this way in certain climates in a different way in other climates? Why does, how does it interact with the soil, with the light? It's infinite. How can you make food out of it? What kind of food out of it? What all the different dishes? Every topic is infinite. Be curious, which means you've got to love life, okay? Uh, secondly is to question authority. We live in a society of rules, and it's probably deep in our DNA that, you know, there could be a rule for this, a rule for that. And it makes sense. I mean, the chimpanzees before us that did not follow all of the rules and just ran out in front of the lion got eaten, and that DNA didn't, didn't go too far. But now in our society, question authority. It doesn't mean like walk in front of a truck and say, I'm going to question like, you know, the laws of physics. Or instead of walking in front of the truck, why don't you like, you know, maybe like walk around the truck or find, a, find another way. My partner Bean and I, we always say to each other, find another way. Whenever we're told no, we say, find another way. There are many ways you can't go, but there's always, always, always another way. Just like there's an infinite amount of knowledge on any possible topic, there is always another way to do something. The third one is to, is to act practically. Is um, Every project can be divided up into a lot of small pieces. And every time you do a small piece, you will have a energy to do the next piece and the next piece. So no matter what project you have, if you're writing a book, write a page a day. If you're trying to manufacture an unlimited supply of organs, start off with manufacturing just a few dozen organs. If you're trying to manufacture a few dozen organs, start off by manufacturing one organ. If you're trying to manufacture one organ, start off manufacturing part of the organ. See if you could keep it going for a minute, an hour, a day. Every single problem can be divided up in a number of little pieces. And fourth and finally is act lovingly. Whatever you do, try to do it in a way that's gonna make the world a happier place. To me, love, uh, the definition of love that uh, resonates most with me is the one from Robert Heinlein, who's, who is my favorite science fiction writer. And uh, his definition of love is, uh, love is the emotion where the happiness of another person or persons is essential to your own happiness. So always act in a way to make the world a happier place. It was probably when people began asking me, like, how did you accomplish all these things, Martine? Um, so it was like in the, I would say like around 50 when I began to ask, like, to speak to other groups and share inspiration with other groups. So I had to kind of analyze what my algorithm was, if, if, if I could put it that way. And I realized like my algorithm was first um, just loving knowledge. That's all that bibliophile, museophile kind of stuff we talked about. Uh, secondly, I realized my algorithm was questioning authority. I mean, you could talk to my kids. I mean, we had the question authority bumper sticker on, <laughs> on our minivan. So all my kids, are, I mean, question authority, I, that's probably my favorite bumper sticker. Uh, that one and celebrate diversity would be like my two favorite bumper stickers. Uh, then the um, do practically is um, everybody kind of says like what you said, like Martine, you've got like all these great ideas, but um, I don't think it's the ideas that's so important. It's what you do with them. It's the execution. It's the being practical. Um, the organization I'm most uh, fond of my membership in is called the American Philosophical Society. 
was started by Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson in the 1700s, and it's still in existence and active in Philadelphia today. And their mantra, which was uh, developed by Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, was um, to celebrate useful knowledge. So it's a practicality, and we all know Franklin was a practical person. Thomas Jefferson was a very practical person. I think it's being able to um, relate to other people um, and encourage other people to to do the to do more than they think they can do, to to show them through some like kind of breadcrumbs that I know you didn't think that you could do this, but you actually can do it. If you do this breadcrumb, that breadcrumb, you know, these five breadcrumbs, you'll get to your goal. And people are like, whoa, I, I never thought of it that way. So it's encouraging. I, I, I define myself as CEO, standing not chief executive officer. I define it as chief encouragement officer. And what I enjoy doing most of my company is just walking around the laboratories and the hallways and talking to people and, and encouraging them to their next step. I think that's what I'm best at. I, I'm not a, a molecular biologist. I'm not a pharmacologist. Um, I did understand the type of medicine that we needed to make. Um, I wasn't going to be the person in the laboratory with the white coat and the pipette and the test tube. But I was able to find all of those chemists and show them that this is a molecule you could make. These are the steps on how you would make it. Maybe a, a really good uh, analogy to me is I'm a conductor. Okay, a, a conductor's job is to make sure that every musician in the orchestra uh, does the best that they can do and shows them that they can all play a symphony together that probably none of them thought they could do. And the conductor gets them all to work together by knowing each person's part. When you look at a conductor's um, score of music, it's got the strings, the horns, the trumpets, it's got everybody's stanza on there. And so I'm kind of a conductor and a composer of practical technologies. I like to play jazz, I like to play blues, uh, but I also play popular songs. I like to play songs like um, Fly Me to the Moon, you know, just like little popular things. I play some classical music, I like to play Chopin preludes. I love this song, it's another just popular song called Impossible Dream. It, it was a theme song for um, uh, Man from La Mancha, I think, yeah. So I, I can play that. Um, I play flute. Um, I like uh, improvising. I like doing jazz improvisation on food. Right now I'm playing, I'm practicing a song called Color My World by Chicago because um, the head of clinical development at United Therapeutics, Lee Peterson, she's a, a total amazing rock and roll drummer. She's got two bands in uh, the Raleigh-Durham area. And um, so for our Christmas parties, her band uh, plays at our Christmas parties and like we dance and enjoy it. And um, I, they insist that I come up and like play one song with them, which I don't want to be like that CEO of like pushing himself on, on the band. But originally I agreed to do the cowbell, so I play like cowbell with them on one song. And this year we're doing uh, Color My World is one of the songs. So I'm going to play the flute part, which comes in like in the third, third section of that song. One of the points I, I made in my book, Virtually Human, that I believe the, uh, the two most important professions in the future, and uh, some people don't like to hear this, but I had to like say my truth, were psychologists and lawyers. Because um, as our, our minds are extraordinarily complex, and as we create cyber-conscious twins of ourselves, we're only going to become more complex. It's like basically a cyber conscious twin of yourself is essentially like what it says. You're going to have like two minds to manage. And a lot of us can like barely manage our one mind. And we're going to need professional help. So by uploading uh, your personality, recollections, feelings, mannerisms, beliefs, attitudes, and values digitally and coupling that with software that can figure out your, the way you respond to the world, but do that all digitally, there will be a second one of you 
that is operating outside of your flesh body. So in the, in the future, the two most important professions are going to be psychologists and lawyers. Psychologists, because as we have more and more things that we need to grapple with with our minds, um, it's going to be hard to sort through it. It would only be natural that we need expert guides to help us sort through the emotional pain that we have from relationships, from career choices, from life choices. The one thing that has continued to increase in our lives are choices. And it's, it's hard to make those choices. Um, it's good to have an expert guide to help you. And that's what, um, whether you want to call them therapists or psychologists or psychiatrists, that's what they do. As we begin digitally uploading our mind and having digital twins, or what we call cyber conscious versions of ourselves, the uh, choices and the options are going to become even more complicated. Also, the benefits will grow as well, but it never stopped people. People always uh, were willing to accept the problems that went along with the benefits. We like cars, but we have like tens of thousands of people that die every year in car accidents. We accept that because we like cars. We're going to have a lot of emotional pain by having a digital twin, but we'll accept that for the benefits of being able to process twice as much reality as we can do when we're just one mind doing it. To give you an example, you'll be able to do, say, <clears throat> three interviews at the same time of different people. Um, it'll be great content from all three of the interviews. Each of the, say, two digital twins of yourself will brief you, will give you the cliff note version, will brief all three of you the cliff note version of how the interview went. You can stream it, you can watch it. You may be a little bit slower, your digital twins a little bit faster. So your mind will literally expand. Face-to-face -face on a screen, and then with a hologram, and then um, I don't know if you've seen like the Bina 48 robot that we've built. And um, so they'll, they'll be physically instantiated sooner than you think. You'll be able to live like two lives in the time of one, and that will cause stress that will also cause benefit. And the psychologists are there to help you with the stress. The other thing is like more people, more options, more social collisions, and that's the job of lawyers. A lot of people likes to a lot of people like to knock down lawyers, but they kind of forget before there were lawyers, things were settled with swords and arrows, and lawyers are there to prevent us settling things with swords and arrows. This century, things are, are moving very fast, as Ray Kurzweil says, because of the exponential growth in information technology, this century will be equivalent in linear time to a thousand years. So if I was to say something would take 300 years to happen, it's going to happen in 30 real years. Well, it's impossible for me to answer that, that question because I'm only one transgender person, and every, every transgender person is different, you know? So I really can't speak for everybody else. I could say for me, um, it's the conception that I, that I don't want to be one sex and I only want to be the other gender, okay? So it's the either or conception. And in fact, um, I don't really like the boundary of, you know, male or female. Um, I enjoy transcending that boundary. I have male energy. I have female energy. Intellectually, um, like the tribe that I would claim for myself is the female tribe. I think it's probably more because I'm just in absolute awe, more in awe of women than I am in, of men. It would be like, you know, picking a sports team that you like better. When I, I think, as I said in my remarks, I mean, the incredible burden that uh, women have, I, I think women have carried this civilization on their backs. And I, I cannot wrap my head at all around uh, misogyny uh, or racism these kind of artificial reasons to be against a, a demographic or a characteristic, it, it's completely it, it, idiocy to me. I don't understand it, you know? And why somebody else would tell somebody what to do with their own body, I, I, I don't get it. 
So I identify with women, but it doesn't mean that like my gender is is like just female or just male. My gender is Martine. And I'm very happy just being an individualistic uh, gender. I wrote this book uh, titled The Apartheid of Sex uh, back in the 90s. And while a lot of people now, they don't really know what the word apartheid means, but it, it, it meant the artificial division of everybody in South Africa into being either black or white, and you had like separate legal rules that went with you if you were black or white. And to me, it's just as artificial to, div to divide all people into saying you're either male or female. If, you have ma if you're male, you've got certain rights. If you got like female, you know, you can be paid less and blah, blah, blah. So I don't like artificial um, borders like that. It runs against my own personal spirit. So to summarize, the biggest uh, um, misconception about transgender people is that all transgender people want to like run away from their old gender and go to a new one. That is true for many people, okay, but it's not true for everybody. And one of the things I'm super, super happy about um, with the millennial generation is I see so many people coming out as gender non-binary which is in the apartheid of sex. That's why I, I called it the apartheid is like in that book, I said there really is not just two separate genders. There's a million different genders. And now I've got friends of mine saying, oh my God, I don't know what to do. My daughter is uh, saying that like, you know, she doesn't want to be a girl and she doesn't want to be a boy. And she, yeah. I said, well, so what? <laughs> I mean, you know, I say, love the person as they are. Love the person as they are. Why are you, it's their life. You know, you've got your life. Why are you trying to impose like a particular gender on, on, on either, whether it's, it's your son or your daughter or your offspring? And they usually say things similar to what people said to me being in interracial marriage. They say, oh, well, like, they're going to have a tough time in society. And, you know, your kids are going to be like not black or not white. And, and it's like our spirit is stronger than other people's oppression. Our spirit is stronger than other people's prejudice. The people would rather face social difficulties um, and overcome them than live their entire life in a mental prison. If you ask me, like, what's my favorite word? I mean, nobody ever asked me this. I'm just asking myself it right now. I would probably say transcendental. I just love transcending things. What in fact, on, on Twitter, when I describe myself, I say I'm a transcender, not transgender. I'm transcending the border of my body to connect with a, with a greater, greater collectivity. I'm transcending white or black to just be a person. I'm transcending flesh to be a consciousness. I'm transcending earth to be part of our galaxy. I'm transcending limitations to be unlimited.